Ring ring cling, I'm sal. Ring ring shring, ka e i la ring. Ha sa ka ha la ring, sa ka la ring. Sal I'm cling ring shring. Aum. Namaste. So today I want to talk about the power of the guru and in spiritual life basically the guru's mercy the guru's grace the guru's anugraha or blessing is everything we cannot make spiritual advancement by our own efforts if we could there would be no need for scriptures gurus, temples, any kind of sadhana or whatever. And actually one reaches this stage, but at the very end of the path, when the guru becomes internalized. In the beginning of the path, which is where most people are at, the guru's grace is everything. And I have some quotations from Ramana Maharshi's conversations to uh, illustrate this point. Maharshi says, grace is always there. Dispassion cannot be acquired, nor realization of the truth, nor inherence in the self in the absence of Guru's grace, the master quoted. So this is because the guru is the motive force, is the power that moves us on the path. Our own efforts can only purify the mind to the degree that we become susceptible or receptive to guru's grace. And Guru's grace is there all the time. Why is that? Well, here's the next quote. The devotee says, realization is said to be helped by Guru's grace. Maharshi replies, Guru is none other than the self. So the self is always present, either externally as the Guru, in a form or formlessly all pervading as pure awareness brahman so actually we are nothing but brahman this is the highest realization but it's not just an intellectual understanding yes it's good to study scriptures it's good to hear different talks and conversations on the subject but ultimately, we have to realize it for ourselves. And that means sadhana. But without the Guru's grace, one cannot advance in sadhana. One cannot reach desirelessness or detachment. One cannot realize the self within oneself. And certainly, one cannot attain moksha. So the Guru's grace is actually everything. Uh, the other stuff that we do, <laughs> whatever we can do, is simply the preparation for receiving it. Maharshi says, Guru's grace is like a hand extended to help you out of the water, or it makes your way easier for the removal of ignorance. The devotee asks, is it not like a medicine to cure the disease of avidya, ignorance? Maharshi says, what is medicine for? It is only to restore the patient to the original state of health. What is this talk of guru, grace, God, etc.? Do you think the guru will hold you by the hand and whisper something in your ear? In that case, you imagine him to be like yourself. Because you are with a body, you think that he is also a body, 
in order to do something tangible to you. No, his work lies within. This is a very telling quote. Huh? This is a really informative quote. In other words, the guru as a person is one who has realized the self, that he is non-different from the self. And so he is an example and he is also an energy field in which one can feel this realization, what it's actually like. Huh? And one can interact with the self as if in a body. So that doesn't mean that the role of the guru is to give initiations into mantras or to perform ceremony for some material result. Uh, this isn't really guru. In India, there's a concept called Kula Guru, which means like a family guru who does different sacrifices for the material well-being of the family members. But this is not really guru. Guru means heavy. Heavy with knowledge and realization. Guru is actually the self. And whether the self appears externally in the form of a human who is fully realized or internally in the form of one's own self, huh? the heart, the reality, Brahman, still the guru is the same and is giving the same message, the same instructions. And this is the medicine that we need to cure us of the disease of avidya, ignorance. Avidya means simply not knowing that I am Brahman, Brahm Brahmasmi, not knowing that I am the self. And he goes on. How is Guru gained? God, who is imminent, in his grace takes pity on the loving devotee and manifests himself as a being according to the devotee's standard. The devotee thinks that he is a man and expects relationship as between bodies. But the guru, who is God or self-incarnate, works from within, helps the man to see the error of his ways, guides him in the right path until he realizes the self within. After realization, the disciple feels, I was so worried before. I am, after all, always the self, the same as before, but not affected by anything. Where is he who was miserable? He is nowhere to be seen. So, in other words, in the beginning of the relationship between the disciple and the guru, the disciple thinks that the guru is another human being like himself. But actually, it's not true. Actually, the guru is an incarnation of the self, an avatar. And this can be seen in the birth chart of the guru. I'm, after this, I'm going to do a whole series on the birth chart of the guru, and uh, we'll see the different indications. But for right now, we have to understand the, the big view that when the disciple finally realizes the self, he says, oh, well, actually, I was the self all along. <laughs> In other words, nothing changes. Only the, uh, the veil goes away. Huh? The upadis, the limiting adjuncts that hide one's real nature as the self. And at that time, one also realizes, oh, the guru is also the self. But here's another great quote. Is success in self-realization, not dependent on Guru's grace? Maharshi answers, yes, it is. Is not your practice itself due to such grace? The fruits are the result of the practice and follow it automatically. There is a stanza in Kaivalya Navanita which says, O Guru, you have always been with me, watching me through several reincarnations and ordaining my course until I was liberated. 
The self manifests externally as guru when occasion arises. Otherwise, he is always within, doing the needful. So any practices that we do to prepare ourselves to receive guru's grace are also due to guru's grace. <laughs> There's another quote, which I couldn't find, uh, you know, while doing the research for this, but it says that one thinks of God by the grace of God. Grace of God is guru. For example, my Adi guru was known as his divine grace. He was a realized soul. He was fully realized. He knew what he was. And somehow or other, he was teaching in a, uh, a dualistic cult. <laughs> but within himself, he had realized everything. So just by association with the guru, then this reveals our true nature. And so the guru will give all the practices necessary to prepare oneself for realization of this, of this true nature. And so the guru, the scriptures, who are also written by gurus, <laughs> the, the teachings of the guru, the interaction, especially the conversations between the disciple and the guru, are all manifestations of guru's grace. This is very much emphasized in the Upanishads. Upanishad means come close and sit down and listen. Huh? So one should listen very carefully to the instructions of the guru. And in this way, one's path to realization is made clear. Another visitor asked, please tell me which is the most efficacious of all the methods? Prayer to God, Guru Anugraha, Master's Grace, Concentration of Mind, etc. Maharshi replies, The one is the consequence of the other. Each of them leads to the next stage. They form a continuous whole. God, Guru, and the Self are not different. They are one and the same. Therefore, the methods offer no choice. This is wonderful because actually points up the fact that we have no choice. We have no free will. Huh? Somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to join this spiritual group and do this practice. And then a little bit later on, he says, no, actually, I'm going to change to this other spiritual group and do some other practice. And then maybe it happens again or several times in a person's life. One who is in ego identification thinks, oh, this was my choice. I did this. I changed my mind. I moved from one group or one practice to another. But actually, the whole thing is ordained by guru. We are driven by destiny to attain the real self whether it happens tomorrow or after a thousand births, the principle is always the same. The self is always who we really are. And <laughs> the only thing that keeps us from realizing it is our own attachment to being an individual, uh, having an ego, being the doer, the knower, the owner, the enjoyer, and so on. But none of these are true because they're all temporary. But when we finally realize our real nature as the self, then this is the eternal state. This is the final realization. And this is the source of all real happiness. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.